Welcome to the Worship of God with Northside Drive Baptist Church on this Sunday, July 26. I'm so delighted to be worshiping with you in this online way. Uh, just an hour before you watch this, we've concluded, hopefully, uh, a live, in-person, on-the-lawn, socially distanced worship service. Wow, that was a mouthful. But I hope that went well and wasn't rained out. For those of you who are joining us in this online way, welcome. Uh, may you be attentive to what God has for you during the service and this week. I'm going to say a few things about the service today. First, um, there will be a variety of musical selections, of course, by Keith and Melinda. Um, Will Matthews, who's our administrative assistant, is reading excerpts from the 105th Psalm. And James will preach to us from the 13th chapter of Matthew about a series of parables uh, that Jesus gives the disciples. And it's called Hidden Treasure. So may we be looking for the treasure that God has for us in the service and in the week ahead. In a moment, I'll pray for us. At the end of the prayer, I invite you to say the Lord's Prayer with me. But first, let's enter into a period of reflective silence. Uh, usually, I would have a bell to toll. I don't have a nice handbell here at the house. So let's just enter into the silence without the bell this week. Let's do that now. Welcome back from the silence. I'm going to pray for and with you, and at the end I'd ask you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me. Oh God, you speak of kingdoms, and we look in vain for one we like. You speak of hidden treasure, and we imagine you're going to make us wealthy. You speak, and so often we don't listen. Our ears are stopped up. Like the disciples, we pretend we understand, but more and more these days, we understand less and less. So come now, O God, into this world we imagine we made, and show us the world you made in all its splendor. Uncreate all that is unjust and malevolent. Teach us about your kingdom come. Teach us about your will being done. Invite us again to experience joy. Invite us anew to discovery of fields laden with treasure. Treasure that provokes in us a deep joy. Treasure that causes us to change our downward slide. Treasure that rewards deep inquiry and fidelity. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray that treasure of a prayer that we'll say together now. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Psalm 105, verses 1 through 11. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth, and he is mindful of his covenant forever. Of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an ever-loving, lasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Praise the Lord. Today's Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13. Some of you may remember that over the last few weeks we've been reading from that, this chapter, and there have been nine parables that Jesus uh, has been telling that are all in, encapsulated in this, this uh, chapter. These are the last six that I'm about to read. I'll be reading verses 31 through 33, then verses 44 through 52. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. It's the smallest of the seeds, but when it has been uh, sown and then grown, it's the greatest of the shrubs. It becomes a tree so that birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that is hidden in a field which someone found and hid and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where it will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? Jesus asked. They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure all that is new and that which is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Due to some technical difficulties, we're having to do the uh, video recording, not in the sanctuary or the chapel, but in uh, uh, Daniel Hedrick's yard. Fortunately, it's only 97 degrees, and so we'll all be fine. The sermon title is entitled, uh, entitled Hidden Treasures, Hidden Treasures. And the thesis is that the presence of God is, present everywhere, that the presence of God is present everywhere. However, it is hidden from us and often hard to see. That's what I'm going to be preaching about. I want to start with a story. Once upon a time, there was a doctor who lived in London. This was back in the early 1800s. And he was a physician, a medical, and his medical practice was there. He'd lived there nearly all of his life. Um, but he had, uh, he had some depression. And though he was a medical doctor, he struggled with depression for a good bit of his life, even as he was a young man. To deal with that and to make time move along, he started, even as a boy, making lists 
of things. Cataloging, making lists of just about everything. When he was older, he got interested in words, and making lists of words. And I can imagine that one day he was walking down the streets, middle 1800s, carrying a wad of papers under his hands, and there, there he stopped on the street. And someone says, hey doc, uh, what you carrying in the papers? And he says, oh, I'm carrying uh, lists of words. Well, what are the words, they ask him. Well, they're synonyms, he says, stacks and lists of words of various meanings. Someone says, well, that's interesting, Doc. What are you going to call that? He said, I think I will call it a thesaurus. Oh, that's interesting. Why would you call it a thesaurus, Doc? Well, says he, because thesaurus means treasure. And this is a real treasure. The doctor's name was Roger. Dr. Roger, who invented Roger's thesaurus. Long before the Oxford English Dictionary was written and published, he had already published his thesaurus. Uh, it's kind of lost to time of why he called it that, but I can kind of see why he did. It's a real treasure. I know it helped get me through college and then write many an uh, essay and composition and through graduate school as well. Perhaps you still have it on your shelves unless you've uh, given it away to goodwill between now and then. It is a real treasure. When I came across that word, thesaurus, I found it in the Bible. In fact, it's twice in the text that I just read. A man was plowing in a field and found there a buried thesaurus. It means treasure, a buried treasure. When I saw that in the Bible, it opened my imagination to all sorts of uh, ways of seeing this text, of seeing how many different ways Jesus goes about trying to let us look through the lens of all the synonyms of what the kingdom of heaven might be like. It is like yeast in dough. It is like fish in the sea. It is like a pearl hidden among other pearls at a flea market that someone finds. Those two words of hidden and treasure seem to follow throughout these six parables. It's a hidden treasure. That's what I wanted to hold up for you today and let you try to imagine as you go through life this week, looking around at how the presence of God might be just everywhere, but it's somehow hidden and blocked from our view. The rabbis say that perhaps that burning bush that Moses saw in the wilderness long ago, it may have been burning for 400 years, but no other shepherd had turned aside to see it. They were so busy with the ordinary task of tending the sheep that they hadn't glanced to the hills, seen the burning bush and said, I must turn aside and see this great sight. Perhaps our lives are like that because of the COVID crisis, because of all the other issues that we struggle with in our politically polarized, charged world that we end up with blinders on and we forget to see that God is present everywhere and in everything. I'm guessing that Jesus' audience there around the Sea of Galilee, they would have had the same problem. They, on the one side, would have been haunted by the, uh, the, the occupying presence of the Roman ar army. I would call that the kingdom of Herod. On the other side, they had a religious system that, and I want to be conscientious and not derogatory here, but as all religious systems can become, it can become more fundamentalist driven through a matter of codes and rules and laws and hierarchy and authorities. And between that kind of religion that at least the New Testament writers saw it to be in that day, and between that kind of oppression between the Roman government, their, their lives were narrowed. My hunch is their ears were uh, covered up. And so Jesus appeals to something else. He goes with these parables. And these parables are visual of 
the sower in the field or the mustard seed among the other seeds. And these parables are like a screwdriver stuck uh, in under the lip of a paint can and popped open. That the parable isn't just a harmless little old story, isn't that special? But rather a parable is subversive and inverts the world in which they live. That's what this parable is like, this story of a man plowing in the field and suddenly the plow hits something. Now my hunch is he thought it was a rock. Uh, I've been to the Holy Land and uh, every square feet of dirt has at least two rocks in it, if not three. And so even there, bang, he hits a rock with a plow and thought, thinks, oh well, I've got to stop and remove the rock. But in the imagination that we're given in the parable, he finds not another stone, but he finds there a buried treasure. Now our imaginations run wild. Jesus doesn't say why he didn't go tell the owner of the field in this parable, or why he didn't just slip it under his cloak and sneak away, although it may have been hard to hide under your robe. It just says that he finds it, buries it again, and then goes and sells everything he has so that he can buy the field with the treasure included. It serendipitously comes to him. He's busy going through his everyday life, plowing the field, and bang, there's the treasure. Right next to it is another story. It's similar. It's a man looking for uh, expensive pearls, and he is a collector of pearls. But then he finds one that is of great price. Maybe he's looked for it all of his life. Maybe it's in a flea market or a garage sale or among others, but he's got to have it. He ends up selling everything he has so that he can go and buy that one pearl. Now, he's searching for it and finds it. The other parable is serendipitous. He's not searching for a treasure. So here's one that's searched for. Here's one that you find accidentally, serendipitously. But how they choose to handle it next is the same. He sells all he has. He sells all he has to be able to get this one thing. Now, the guy who found the buried treasure, it says, and he did so with joy, sell everything to find that. What I hear emerging for me in this parable is that somehow the presence of God, discovering that that is true, changes all of life and is worth whatever it, whatever it takes. It is a gift to how I see my life, my neighbor, my enemy, uh, persons of, uh, that are different from me, persons on the other side of the world. Indeed, if God is in every one, the imago dei is carried by every person, then that's going to change how I relate to people. I suppose that's the challenge for you and me this week. That's the screwdriver under the lip of the lid of the paint can that opens, that we can live so myopic lives, just relating to people that look like us and think like us and do like us, that it's a challenge to love other people that are different from us. I wrote down some of the challenges for me uh, this week. Maybe they are for you as well. For instance, as I struggle with knowing people that have COVID and having to wear masks whenever I'm out with someone, that it could, I could easily live a smaller and smaller life rather than saying, how might God be trying to teach me something during this time of quarantine? It is a struggle that I have, you have, as we struggle asking questions like, what should leadership in our country and in our world look like these days? How might that affect how I look at how God might be in all things working together uh, for good for those who love God? In addition, we struggle with personal issues, from our health issues to money to relationships. But just it might just be that if we don't discover this week a vaccine for uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus, what if the vaccine might be a, a thesaurus of theology so as to look for God in all people, to look for God 
among the things of this of this uh, life and of this world. It could be, as some scientists have said, suddenly the Himalayans are are viewable now, and the smog has cleared during this global shutdown. Some have said that that in the silence of the seas, the whale song is heard more clearly now that the seas are more silent. I myself, as I listen to the renewed civil rights movement that has returned to us, I can hear the rumblings of the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew described it, the rumblings of the kingdom of heaven beneath the earthquake-like rage of the civil rights movement that has chiseled, plowed once again the hardened earth of separate and unequal. I can see the kingdom of heaven even as I look into the hollow eyes of the homeless guy who stands on the corner looking for food. I guess it's a, it's a developed behavior that we have to pray that God would give us. A few weeks ago I preached a sermon entitled Where You Stand Determines What You See. Well it's also true what you see determines where you stand. It would be my prayer that God widens our perspective, changes what we see, and when we can see life and world and others different, it will help us take, a, take new stands in the stands that we need to take in life. That's it. Let's ponder these things in our heart and have some time of silence.
Perhaps it is today that we've heard a message through the Word and the words. Perhaps it is that we've heard the Word of God through the gift of music and the gift of song. In whatever way that message has come, as we look at the wide ways that God happens to us, among us in this world, hear this word as we prepare to go into the week. May the strength of Christ uplift you, the comfort of the Holy Spirit surround you, and the grace and mercy of God give you hope and give you courage this day and every day as we go into the week with a new peace of Christ. Amen.